There we go. We're very happy to have Simon Jacobs with us today. Thank you very much, Simon, for agreeing to be interviewed as part of our project. And Pleasure. we're going to start off uh, with a few quite background questions for context. And we'll start off by asking you, where were your parents born? Uh, England. Okay. And where were London. you born? Uh, it's, I was brought up in England. Uh, I'll put it that way. I was okay. born in, in Africa, but uh, I didn't live there very long. Okay. And where did you receive your education? Elementary, secondary, and any post-secondary? Elementary and secondary was in England. And uh, post-secondary uh, was uh, I did an undergraduate in Toronto and a master's and MBA at Laval University. Very good. And what is your current occupation? Confused. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is my current occupation? Okay, right now I'm specifically working on a class action war lawsuit. Um, hunting and seeking, uh, trying to find people that can apply for the actual lawsuit. Okay, very good. And where do you live now? I live in Quebec City. Very good. All right, we're going to get what I like to call the meat of the matter here. These are questions concerning your experience living in Quebec today. And we'll start out by asking you, what is the best thing in your mind about living in Quebec? Oh, well, first of all, I'll be more specific that I live in Quebec City, which is somewhat different from living in Montreal. Mm -hmm. um, I love living here because... Uh, from a historical point of view, it's just so varied and the roots go deep. Um, uh, actually, I, did, I mentioned I work as a, uh, uh, in this class action, but I'm also a professional tour guide as well, and I'm a historian. So go figure. So I'm saying confused. Um, <clears throat> so the history point of view, uh, the amount of visitors and so on, uh, I find fascinating and it's great to work. Also, the other thing is it's a very small community. Um, in a sense, having a small community, actually, it's more like a, a large village as far as the English community is concerned. Uh, there are only two high schools, uh, really, um, that St. Patrick's and uh, Quebec High School. I know that they're even going to be joining pretty soon. Um, so that's from the English point of view. So everybody knows everybody else. So uh, does that answer the question? Also, actually, it's a great place to live. Sorry, it's, you know, the countryside, uh, it's a city, and the, uh, the, the countryside and um, different activities are within 15, 20 minute drive. What, what one ask, can one ask for? Okay. Um, we're gonna take a bit of a time out because in my introduction, I should mention a couple of things. One is the questions as posed have been carefully formulated to be very, uh, unbiased, uh, but we encourage everyone to speak freely about anything they want, come down on any side of any issue they want, but the questions themselves, we don't want them to be perceived as leading at all, so we've tried to craft them that way. I will not be commenting on any responses that you give, nor will I be asking any follow-up questions. So if you, if you don't hear me saying anything in return, you understand why, okay? Okay, fine. Fair so enough. I can just answer myself then. Oh, no, absolutely, there you go. I'm very good at that, yes. Oh, great. Excellent. Um, okay, the next question is one of the more difficult ones that, that, that people have found. It. And, and if I was posed this question, I would find it difficult, but I'm gonna ask you to respond as the question is posed, but elaborate on your answer as you see fit. Having said that, the question is, describe your relationship to Quebec in a single word. Married. Uh, it's partly because of marriage, work but marriage that I am living in Quebec. It wasn't originally my idea. And I think like most of the people, especially that I come around, uh, I come across or Anglophones here in Quebec City, most of the time, the reason they are, they are actually living here to begin with is because they, their significant other is a, um, is a Quebecer. 
Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only reason, but ultimately it's something that, I mean, I've been living here for thir- since 89, so it's that 33 years now, 34, my goodness. And uh, <clears throat> so it's definitely Shimwa home. Okay. Would you I, like me to elaborate even more? Or is that no, no, since I, you said one word? There you go. Uh, yep. It's fine. That's great. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to kind of rephrase this. You've kind of alluded to it in your response, but where do you feel most at home in Quebec? For example, in communities based on language, culture, profession, or geographic location? Sorry, I have to think about that one a little bit. Um, uh, where do I feel most at home? Well, home, home is Quebec City, more so than Montreal. Montreal has a, an incredible vibe to it and so on, but I prefer living in Quebec. I have actually lived in Montreal. I was running the McGill Chamber Orchestra for a year and found that uh, um, I, I find that Montreal stresses me out, mainly from the traffic point of view than anything else. Uh, and also, it's just such a large city, though I was brought up in London. But, um, even so, I, mean, uh, I, I do enjoy Quebec City. I enjoy that, that, middle, that middle ground between the country, the way of life, um, also, there's another thing which is going to sound a funny, kind of funny, but there's no ambiguity as far as language is concerned. We do not have the same problems that other people will discover um, in other parts, especially in Montreal, where it, the battle, battle lines are drawn. And from my perspective, it seems that quite often the, um, any linguistic um, legalese or politics that are coming out uh, that affect everybody outside of Montreal is geared to Montreal itself. And so in a funny sort of way, it does things don't make sense outside of Montreal uh, when it comes to the political decisions. Okay, fair enough. Now, uh, the next question, people have had some trouble with, it's a two-part question, and people have had some problems with the second part. They say to me, well, Dave, what do you mean by official? definition and the way the question was formulated was it's the official definition according to what you perceive I mean, in other words it could be the Quebec government's uh, definition the Canadian government the media your peers whatever you perceive to be the official definition of Quebec so having said that I'll ask a two-part question how would you define a Quebecer and do you think the official definition in Quebec includes you? Ah, oh, now that is an interesting question. I think, uh, and here we have a dichotomy or a, a, even an opposing views because sometimes um, I can understand all Quebecers are equal, but some are e- more equal than others. Is that a one way of putting it? Uh, I think it's been said about, uh, about many things, um, in the same way that we can talk about, how would I put it? Um, so you can cut this little bit out. So do you edit? Mm-hmm. Thank God. Okay. Um, it depends also what is said. What I've noticed is um, sometimes there's an idea of a Quebecer is all inclusive and then when you really get down to the nub of it you can find actually it's more leaning towards french canadians um and i'll give you an example of this uh back in must have been about 2011 or 2012 they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of radio canada i believe or, or no i think it was radio canada i'm pretty sure and uh, during that, they had organized at the Parliament buildings a, uh, uh, a talk about the educational system in Quebec. And they had six noteworthy professors at this talk. And what did they talk about was the Catholic school board. The Protestant school board it wasn't even mentioned. They were talking about education in Quebec, but 
it left out one third of the population, especially at that time. So I think there can be uh, sometimes a certain blindsidedness that will happen. Um, I actually came up with a, a term which was um, hemispheric, uh, or hemispheric neglect or hemispheric, hemispheric cultural neglect. And that is, uh, it's very possible in some ways, uh, hemispheric neglect is, is, is a medical term, especially people that have had a stroke, that they're not able to see one part of the hemisphere. They do not know it exists. And it's not willful, it just is not there. And in some ways, I think that is what's happening in Quebec. Sometimes people are, in all goodness of their heart, they believe they're being inclusive and so on, but they have this neglect, it's a cultural neglect. And they don't realize it's part of their own, if you want, uh, uh, everything that they're used to uh, or part of their universe. So they're only seeing part of it and they don't see the whole. It can work in both directions, but uh, specific, very especially within Quebec as well. So hemispheric cultural neglect, okay, if you want to come down to a specific term. Okay, and how about your sense of identity as a, as a Quebecer? Has it changed over the years? And if so, in what ways? That's an interesting one as well. I came here in 89, uh, and that was the whole lead up to the second referendum. My French was, for all intents and purposes, non-existent, so I picked it up off the street. Um, and leading up to the referendum, I think it's a combat, it, it's not because it's the referendum, but I think it was a question of um, acceptance, of my, my own acceptance of where I am or where I was at the time. And saying, um, uh, not feeling at home, not uh, feeling an outsider. Along, and it so happened to coincide with the referendum. So maybe that has nothing to do with it, but in, I think around 95 or 96, basically, I realized no, this is where I'm staying. It was also because of my wife, I thought she would want to move because we were both symphony musicians. And um, no, she was very satisfied and loved living here. I can understand it's a great place to bring up a family. And so we said, I, I said to myself, okay, wait a second. This is, this is my home. This is my, if you have a problem with it, if you don't understand me when I mispronounce a word, is that my problem or is that your problem? And ultimately, at that point, I decided to own the place and make it mine. And that's what I've done. So also from a historical point of view, I mean, as I said, I'm a tour guide. I've written, I have a books published, on, especially on the Jewish history of Quebec City, which is a smaller niche market, as it were. But um, it is uh, it's, it's something I really know well uh, the most Quebec is, I would say, in some ways. So the history has put me front and center in a sense of making this shimwa. Okay. And what do you find are some of the most difficult things about living in Quebec? Difficult things about living in Quebec. I think it's sometimes it's the uh, the usual, it's the political aspect uh, of the, um, but ultimately, I think it's actually, it's not that difficult. If, if, when I mean by political, I mean in the sense of relations of one, is the health system run the way it should be? Is the, um, uh, do the buses run on time? Is there enough public transportation? Is and, and But those are things which are not necessarily good or bad in Quebec, they will probably find the same thing anywhere around the world. So I'm going to say uh, in a funny sort of way, well, maybe I'm just in a very positive mood right now, but I, I don't find that there are many big problems to, apart from the language issues. And sometimes um, the possibility of trying to lump people into, or one person represents an entire group. There's a homogen uh, homogeneity of, of the people, and especially when they're especially in Quebec, where they're not exposed as they are in Montreal to different cultures and people. So they tend to see somebody from who's different as representing the entire group, and that can be uh, that can be very difficult. Too. Okay. Now, in recent years, uh, members of uh, Quebec's francophone majority 
have identified a number of linguistic and cultural threats. Which of these concerns do you share and support? And which of these concerns make you feel excluded? Sorry, you're, you're, you're cutting out. Okay, I'll repeat the question. <clears throat> uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn off this uh, headset. It could be the headset, hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Can you try speaking again? Yeah, how's that? Does that work for you? It does work for me, yeah. Okay, good, excellent. So I'll, I'll uh, ask the question again. Uh, in recent years, some members of Quebec's Francophone majority have identified a number of linguistic and cultural threats. Which of these concerns do you share and support? And which of these concerns make you feel excluded or targeted? Um, I understand the desire or the um, uh, the need to protect the French language. I can understand why they want to do that, why it's wanted to do, but sometimes it's taken too drastically. And I think language is mixed up with identity. Uh, which is, which can be problematic, and so we're seeing we're seeing situations where um, opportunities are lost, and it, the people actually lose out the most about it. Uh, not necessarily the anglophones; it could also be the francophones as well. So it's a it's a two edged sword as well. Um, I think having a, a trying to build a society that is uh, functionally bilingual is, is where well, we can you can talk to people in more than two languages, even or three languages as they do in Europe and maintain your identity is, is possible. Uh, by ramming it down people's throats or by uh, the idea of um, limiting CGEP to uh, students, uh, only Anglophone students and no Francophone students going there and so on, I, I think is, is, is way too short-sighted and don't realize that it's gonna just, <sighs> It's going to build a wall and it's going to also lose opportunities for Quebec as it exists. If you want to have just a little village which, uh, you know, gather around the church and there's uh, the priest that tells everybody what to do, or the politician, uh, and we don't go further than that thought, then uh, we're going down the right way. We need, we need people who are capable of understanding life outside and appreciating what we have here. This is an incredible society, but I think it, it, we need to be, uh, Quebecers, and I'm talking about all Quebecers, need to be um, able to communicate amongst each other. And that's the important thing. Is that good enough for a question or do you want other, other responses? Uh, it, it actually leads me into a more general question. Um, what is the biggest problem facing Quebec and how, in your mind, do you think it could be resolved? Give me time on this one, will you? Yeah, absolutely. Take your time. What is the biggest problem facing Quebec? And the solution to that problem? In your mind, yeah. Okay, I think it's really important that we get away from um, polarization within politics. Has it always been a problem? I don't think so. Even when René Levesque was uh, starting off the Parti Québécois and, and those ideas, uh, I think he was open to, uh, he was way more open to sort of multiculturalism and what we're seeing now is more of a polarization of them versus us. And for me, that is dangerous. Uh, it can also lead to the negative aspects in, in nationalism. And I think that is why the last referendum in 95 got everyone really scared because they were seeing this as a nationalistic push as opposed to one of solidarity. So, if you like that, that would be the polarization would be a problem that we need to work together to address. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now the next question, I'm gonna, we'll take a quick break here and I'm gonna ask you if, um, have you had an opportunity to see the great documentary, uh, what, we, <laughs> what We Choose <laughs> Bloody tea. <laughs> Sorry, have I had the opportunity to see the documentary? What we choose to remember is is what the name of it is. It's about. I haven't. Okay, it's about the history of Quebec as seen through the lens of waves of immigration, and it's actually uh, the writer, director, and producer is a friend of mine, Guy Rogers. Yeah, I know Guy. I I, I wanted to see it. I do know Guy. Okay, well, what, what I will do for you is I will send you a link to directly to see it. You can, I mean, I mean, if your TV's hooked up to the internet, you can watch it on your TV. If not, you can watch it on your phone, your iPad, your computer, whatever you like. But I'll send that to you uh, in an email after we're done here. Okay. Uh, the reason I bring that up is that in that documentary, he used a very effective visual tool which I'm going to use in the next question, which is a show of fingers. So I'd like you to indicate by a show of fingers on a scale of one to 10, one being weak, 10 being strong, how strongly do you feel that the joys of living in Quebec outweigh the challenges? Thumbs cap. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna actually. Um, I'm just gonna show with the fingers. I'm gonna give you an eight. That right. the joys of living in Quebec out, uh, outweigh the uh, <clears throat> disadvantages. Because if it was any less, would I still be living here? Very good point. Um. um as I said, there are, there, are, there are many advantages there. There are some certain inconveniences, but uh, what can I say? Yeah. Now, lastly, this um, is- I'm sorry, you asked, you said, you said that I can take this as a, uh, <clears throat> um, you do leading questions and stuff like that. So let me just continue with certain thoughts. Oh, no, no, please go ahead. I didn't realize you weren't done. Go ahead, please. All right, I'm just thinking about it. Um, um, this, I know that Comet, I was actually on Comet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember when it started. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Especially looking at the historical aspects of that and meeting with the, uh, uh, with the ministry. But when it comes to a personal aspect, I sent my kids to school here in Quebec, in French school, partly because I was not allowed to send my kids to English school because I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. I emigrated back in 1980. And um, as a result, my, my wife is a French Canadian. The, the irony of it is that my father-in-law had gone to English school and we missed out by a couple of months the possibility because he went to an English school in Alvira, Alvira, Alvira in northern, in, in, in Saguenay area. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, we could have put our kids into, uh, if he'd been there a couple of months more, we could have put the kids into English school <clears throat> through the grandfather. That said, we ended up sending our kids to private French school, partly because it's so cheap here in comparison with anywhere else. And why did we choose private school was because uh, we, we chose the school specifically on their value, uh, values of English as a second language or the idea of different culture um, and so on. Um, and that was, that was important. Um, we tried to lead the way as opposed to uh, <clears throat> steer away from it from controversy so it's in other words to show uh, and and that has been the most important part um for my kids they're, they're now bilingual trilingual quadrilingual and um they i think they profit they profited a lot from having been brought up here 
in a safe environment and uh, an affordable one. It may not be the same thing as what's happening in Montreal. Can you hold on a second? I have a dog that needs to go out. So go ahead. I can pause that. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to let you continue your thought, but it, it kind of plays into the the last part, which is very simple. The last part is, is there anything else that you would like to say about your sense of identity or belonging in Quebec? So having said that, you could continue on and then add to it as you see fit. Um, okay, so following through with the idea of my, my own children's education, at the same time, I back in uh, 2005, I created a nonprofit organization to present the history of, Jew, of Jews of Quebec City for the 400th anniversary of Quebec City. And um, <clears throat> that took a, a lot of time and effort, uh, but it was well worth it. It was uh, at the uh, Gare du Palais, at the train station in old Quebec City. And thanks to the research, we actually came out with a heck of a lot of information and history that was just either lost or not known. And we came actually with, it was published with a, a, a thick book. I can probably give you an example in a second of, um, of the book that was published by the University Press. And um, I think it's got a long way to showing that uh, you know, Quebec has been more than, than uh, mono, monocultural. It's, there's a, it's never been necessarily a large culture, but there's always been an interaction the other thing is also I ran the Marin Center, which is uh, in Quebec City. Um, and realizing uh, I've worked with Patrick Donovan. I don't know if you know Patrick. Oh, I mean, yeah. I his, his study is, uh, he did a study on, on- I interviewed Patrick for this project. Really? Well, there you go. Well, one of the things that he he came up with, he's looking at it, you know, we, we sometimes see you know, the English as the bosses, you know, this sort of <clears throat> stratification of society. Um, and Probably for French Canadian, if you don't pay much attention or if you read the history books as they are presented, you're going to see the English here and the French here. I don't know if you can see that. So English on the top, like the cream, and then the French, and they drop down trodden us. I think the reality was something different, and that is what needs to be changed, which you're going to see a stratification within French society, and you're going to see the same stratification within English society. It is true that at the top, especially during the 19th and uh, mid 20th century, you do get maybe 20, 30 companies which are massive, you know, the, the, the price company, uh, ABTV Price, uh, you know, the high, uh, the <clears throat> uh, Alcan and stuff, which were ultimately controlled by English, fa English families. And so in a, in a sense, they used to, they, they created the glass ceiling uh, linguistically, but it wasn't done necessarily through society. So when I'm looking at the, looking at the Jewish history, we're looking at something totally different. We're looking at a mer merchant class coming in there. Quite often people would be speaking Yiddish and then French or English would be their, their um, language. And uh, this is another thing from a historical point of view. We, we tend to see the, uh, uh, what do they call the two solitudes uh, but linguistically, those solitudes were actually also forced upon people. The idea of um, <clears throat> uh, school boards. So, for instance, we have a situation of uh, using examples. We have the Cohen family who arrived from uh, Morocco, one of the first ones to arrive in Quebec City in 1950. Um, they, they spoke Arabic, Hebrew, French. And they were forced to go to English school because they weren't Catholic. So uh, I also remember during the, um, during the whole, uh, what was it, the, the, it was after the referendum 
you just hold on a second? I got my dog outside. He's now really wants to come in. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, another anecdotal aspect uh, during the Bouchard Taylor report uh, or commission. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I remember one specifically, one argument that came out. Uh, one guy was very upset, a French Canadian, about the Jewish General Hospital. Why do they have their own hospital? And, uh, you know, they should be more like Quebec. The reason they had their own hospital from a historical point of view was because when the first Jewish doctor graduated from McGill, it was kind of a rarity at that time as well. Um, Saint, uh, I think it was Saint Justin. All the doctors said, "We're going to go on strike if you want to do." Right. And so ultimately, what ended up happening was the um, uh, the, the com Jewish community started to form a Jewish hospital because it's the only place that would hire a Jewish doctor. Uh, so uh, again, uh, maybe my my view. I'm, I'm looking at it from a Jewish perspective because in a funny sort of way, it really hones down. It's like a, looking at a laser at a brick wall. If you look with a flashlight, it's a, it's a monolithic flat surface. But if you start looking at it with, with a very concentrated beam, you can see all the cracks that are there. And so that's particularly that, that's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, you can have somebody from an Irish background looking at it from there. And you can start looking at it from a very pointed point of view. And suddenly it stops becoming monolithic and it starts becoming into the more human aspect of it. Yes. And I think that is the most important part. Um, that's the hard, that's the hardest part I find also with uh, with education uh, when it comes to history. Um, one of the things I wanted uh, for Comec as well um, when we arrived uh, and with Quan, I'm also on the board of and past president of the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wish we could get with the schools. Yeah. Dog, hold on a second. Hold that thought. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sorry. So what, one of the things I was proposing, uh, part of the problem that happens with a history uh, curriculum is Quebec is, is so varied. You've got the large metropolis of Montreal and all its satellite areas. You've got the eastern townships, which is some peculiarity. Uh, and then you can go all the way out to the lower North Shore or up into northern Quebec. And suddenly you're presenting the history that is supposed to be monolithic. She's an old dog. Ah, uh, what can we say? <clears throat> what? You okay, that one? Promptly. You are promptly by the hall. Oh, she wants to play. It's maybe, so she's just maybe she's just telling you it's bloody cold out there. No, no, she's 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 now inside, but she really wants to play. I mean, these toys with her quite uh, often, you know, a fifteen-minute intense squeezy toy type of thing. <laughs> okay, anyway, so where was I? I was talking about the uh, <clears throat> uh, the idea of monolithic history. Yes, um, I think. The problem that happens, especially with young people, me, you, when we were young as well, is that the idea of time, we don't have an idea of time. It's, right. it's not the same thing. So to give out, spew out dates and stuff, at the, <laughs> at the time of youth, it's really difficult to understand. I remember when I was giving a, <clears throat> uh, at the Moran Center, we were talking, I, I said to people, when was the Battle of the Plains of Abraham? Some of the kids actually it was astonishing. These were French Canadian kids. They said, what, 60, 70 years ago? 
I mean, like, <clears throat> old as your parents, really old as your grandparents, mm. prehistory is your great grandparents. Mm. Um, but I think if we can have a situation in Taiwan, we're also very, very um, concerned about heritage and preservation of heritage and preservation of cultural heritage, not just built heritage, but also everything that goes around it. Um, if you don't have an idea of of your own heritage in your own area where you live, then how can you even expand it out to in 1867, you know, uh, there was a confederation of Canada. So what? What has that got to do with me type of thing? So, but the question is, how can you then take local history and apply it to this monolithic board? <clears throat> what I would propose would be a, a, a different approach, maybe in fourth year, spending a third of the time, half the time, to not teaching history per se, but teaching history techniques. How to do a research, how to document, how to interview somebody, how to document that interview, how to research what the person said. So you could, and these are tools which kids, if they learn, will be really, really applicable in their lives outside outside of school, you know, how to write a research or how, how to hold an interview. Wow, can you imagine how to interview your parents, how to, <clears throat> and, and also what it requires then is you, you can have a, your PE teacher who's just been dragged in to teach the history course and hates history, can actually follow through on that because it's gonna be local history. And that means also that a child, child, a uh, teenager can then say, <clears throat> You know, uh, I'm going to do research on this house. I get involved with the local history association, get them probably involved with, with some of the pensioners who are involved there, part of the interview process, and then maybe do a research on a uh, building or on, on an area, and therefore be able to say, <clears throat> wow, you know, this building was built in 1867. Wow, I can touch it. That's the same time that the, the Confederation started. Right. So <clears throat> you build bridges, uh, mental bridges between points, and that's the whole point. So suddenly you can get an idea of time and place and start developing that. And that is something that's going to be able to live with them over the years. Uh, so uh, and that is something that you can test on, not on the personal, uh, uh, on, you know, if it's Shibugamo, you don't need to know the history of Shibugamo, but you test them in is uh, what is the technique for, or what are the specific things that you need to do to carry out an interview? What are the specific, uh, how do you set it up? So you can actually test them on technique and not on content, but by applying it to content, they learn the technique and vice versa. So I think that would be a much more interesting thing. And also it would give people a much better sense of place and of time because then you can be out in the gas bay and you can really learn about your, your history. And maybe you want to put your roots down there more than if it's on sort of monolithic thing, uh, it's happening in Montreal. Let's go to Montreal and see what happens. And then you depopulate the area. So I think part of it is also pride of place. And also, if you can get it in where it's also looking at it from a point from a the mixed cultural point of view, then that's even better. So because it does exist. First Jewish city council was uh, uh, Hyman. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the Parc de Florian um, <clears throat> in the Gas Bay was his actual store. He was from Russia, a Russian Jew. He helped break the, uh, the monopoly of salt fish in, um, uh, from, from the Guernsey Island, Guernsey in Jersey. So it's, it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff, which is... As I said, you can look at it through a very, very specific point of view. You know, if you find you have Greek heritage or Portuguese heritage or whatever, you can look through that and you're going to discover a microcosm of information that they just cannot teach you. And so I think uh, I think we can break down this monolithic, you know, them and us, you are one thing. And we need to say we are individuals. And as, it, as individuals, we make up our society and we should be proud of it and protect it 
And I think a lot of that comes through history and understanding from where we, where we come, as opposed to being spoon fed. I, uh, that, that these, these are great insights. I'm gonna stop the recording now and we can continue a conversation afterwards, but I just wanna go on record as thanking you very much for your insight. Everybody's story is valid, as you point out. And it was great to have you uh, participate in this. And thank you very much. Pleasure.